In my previous two videos, I did compression and leak down tests, resulting in the need to replace the head gasket on this CRV. This is part one, which starts with everything in place and ends at the removal of the plastic outer inlet manifold. This simple job turned out to be rather more involved than I had anticipated. Here is a general overview of what's under the bonnet on the Honda CRV with the K20 2 litre engine. I've highlighted the main parts that we will be removing in this part one of the series. To remove the outer inlet manifold, we need to do the following tasks. Disconnect the battery, remove the engine undershield, drain the cooling system, remove the auxiliary drive belt, depressurize the fuel system and remove the plastic outer intake manifold. Here are some of the tools required. 8, 10, 12, 17 and 19 mm socket, 10 mm hex for the engine drain plug, two 14 mm spanners or one long one and some plumber's water pump pliers are handy. So for safety we disconnect the negative off the battery and we use a 10 mm socket for that and then just lift it up out of the way and tuck it to one side. When jacking up the CRV make sure you put the trolley jack here where the yellow is. There is an arrow there to show you. So the jack must be there, otherwise you risk buckling the seam on the sill, as somebody has already done there previously. Okay, I'll get the head of the jack in the correct position and just lift it slightly, but not to lift the wheel off the ground, because I need to break all the nuts off with the breaker bar and a 19mm socket. Once that's done, I can fully raise the vehicle and then just wind all the nuts off easily. I'm using a set of skates there so I can move the vehicle around the garage because of limited space. So we take these wheel nuts off, get that wheel out of the way and then we'll have access to this side of the engine which will also make removing the under tray easier. Don't forget to make safe the vehicle using axle stands because we will be popping our head under there where the radiator is. I've marked two of the plastic clips in yellow that will need to be removed when removing the under tray. There are more plastic clips than this underneath, but my vehicle, they've already been removed by the previous owner. So removing this one clip removes the whole of the under shield. So our first main task is to drain the cooling system. Thankfully, the radiator has its own drain plug, which makes things easy at this stage. Having set the cabin temperature to maximum on the heater, we can then remove the radiator cap and the expansion bottle cap, like so, and then we can drain the coolant underneath from the radiator drain plug. Using our green coolant catch pan, so all you've got to do is undo the drain plug and let the coolant drain out into the pan. I would add some photos of the engine drain plug which needs a 10mm hex and it's located just above the oil filter. With the driver's wheel off it's reasonably accessible through the wheel arch. Next comes the removal of the auxiliary drive belt. This I found a bit tricky due to severe lack of space. In the end I placed a jack under the engine and removed the engine mount so that I could gain some space to move the spanners. I say spanners as it required two linked together which I personally felt was an unsafe way to do this. I have since ordered a long 14mm spanner. If you're going to be reusing the auxiliary drive belt it makes sense to mark the direction of rotation so that you can refit it in the same way. Here you can see the tensioner and the engine mounting bracket. The tensioner requires 14mm spanner and if you do decide to remove the bracket that's a 17mm long reach. So you can move the power steering reservoir just out of the way slightly. That gives you a little bit more access and the theory is um, you use two 14mm spanners 
and you join them together and use it as a lever but to be honest I couldn't get enough turn on it and it certainly didn't feel safe so because I couldn't get any angle of movement onto that tensioner um, I concluded in the end to just put a bottle jack under the engine to support it and using a 17 millimeter long reach socket remove the engine mounting bracket this at least then gave me enough movement on the tensioner to be able to take the tension off that tensioner so I had a chance of getting the belt off. I think the real answer here is probably an extra long 14mm spanner. I mean you can get them that are like 30, 30 to 40 centimetres long. Now maybe one of those would have got in there okay. Though I'm still not sure about the angle of movement because it seems so limited. Note that the nut on the very long bolt is actually a bit deeper than the other nut. I'll hold them together and you can see one is much shallower than the other. So with the engine brackets moved out of the way, we've certainly got a little bit more access now and if we can get a spanner onto that, we certainly should be able to get a nice angle of movement onto it so that we can get that tensioner pushed out of the way. So I'm going to link the spanners together as the Haynes manual mentions though I am very worried that if one of the jaws snapped by putting too much torque on it my hands are going to go shooting into the front of the car. Um, so I've definitely put gloves on, leather gloves. I mean it's working, I can now pull that tensioner forward. Um, it's still a lot of hard work, but I can at least now try and nudge that belt off. Now that we've actually got the belt off, we just need to retrieve it. I think it's probably better to work from the underside of the car where there's probably a little bit more space. I've done it from the top just so that the camera can be showing this. But like I said, I think it's probably easier from the bottom. I was also using a serpentine belt tool there just to try and unhook it. And out she comes. It's a pretty long belt, that one. The next day my set of CD Extra Long Spanners arrived. The set was AK6311 and here was a quick photo to show that this spanner is probably a wise purchase to save time and possibly avoid a nasty accident. This spanner made it easy. The auxiliary belt was just a warm up for the fun to come. Removing the plastic outer manifold was to be another test of patience and perseverance. Honda seemed very good at packing small items into very tight spaces, so without any more delay, onto the manifold. We will need to depressurise the fuel system, as we need to disconnect the fuel pipe from the injector rail. Simplest method is to remove fuse 17, the blue 15 amp one, which is the fuel pump circuit. Open the fuel tank filler and then crank the engine until it dies. So we can now just pull out the fuse number 17, which is the blue one, from under the driver's side and then we can crank the engine a few times just to depressurise the fuel system. So here's the fuel rail and there's the fuel pipe with the connector which we need to undo. So you see the sort of turquoise green clip there, we need to push that clip in to better pull the fuel pipe off. So I'm just releasing some of the pipes nearby so I can just get my hands in there because again it's very tight. So we just need to squeeze the plastic clip together and then withdraw the fuel pipe connector like so. Make sure you don't spill any petrol and mop up any that does spill. And I'm going to put the other pipes back on just for the sake of accuracy of doing the video. 
The next part will be to remove the air filter assembly. So onto the air filter assembly. For that you use an 8mm socket and there's five bolts to undo on that. That's one, two, three, four and five. We then use a 10mm socket or a flat bladed screwdriver for the Jubilee clip on the tube going from the filter to the throttle body. I'll just undo that. Right, and then we can use some plumbers pliers just to unclip the breather pipe to the aluminium cover of the cams. So there we are, that's the air filter top removed. So let's disconnect this charcoal canister from the throttle body. And this vacuum hose. And disconnect the hose from the intake air bypass control thermal valve union and remove that. We then need to disconnect this pipe from the water pump. I believe it to be the positive crankcase ventilation valve. It leads to the inlet manifold. I'll highlight the pipe in yellow in a photo now. So you need to be able to tuck your hands underneath the power steering pump. I think that just pulled out like so. And there it is. Next up is to disconnect the IMT solenoid valve wiring and undo its mounting nut. The mounting nut is 10mm and it's underneath this wiring loom. I'll highlight the valve, there it is. So I'll just move this out of the way just so I can get, and I needed to undo the connector plug to injector one. And then I was able to get a 10mm long reach onto that. So that's the 10mm bolt out. So all we've got to do now is disconnect the wiring plug. I say all you've got to do. I swear as you get older these connectors get harder to take apart. So that was a push down connector and just pull back. And there we are. Off it is. I'll put the bolt back in so that we don't lose that when I come to reinstall it afterwards. In order to remove the black manifold we have to remove the radiator bonnet lock support bracket. This can be fairly fiddly, I keep saying that, as there is a wiring loom attached to it and a fair few plastic clips in hard to reach places. So using a 10mm socket, remove the battery hold down clamp bolt. Then using an interior trim tool, we need to remove all the little plastic clips on this black panel which is on top of the radiator. And try not to stab yourself with the tool. And just the last one. And then we can lift that away, showing the top of the radiator. Then disconnect the wiring to the bonnet switch and a 10mm socket again to remove the two air intake mounting bolts. 
I'll speed this up a little bit while we take these two out. And there's one, and there's the second one. We now need to remove this support bracket for the radiator and also with the bonnet lock on. Now it's held in with four bolts at the top and they're 10 millimeters. And there's also a central bolt at the bottom. Again, that would be 10 millimeters. On my car, that bottom bolt is missing. So the bracket was free. I think somebody had attempted to weld it. There's also two bolts at the top that support the top of the radiator. And those also need to be undone now. There, I'm undoing one of them now. So in total, we've got seven bolts. I'm also going to put these bolts back in. I don't see the point in having them free floating around the garage. So at least if they're back in, we know where the bolts are. Yeah, and we'll pop that one back in again. That's the other side of the radiator support bracket. So we've just got the other two down here. They're quite short, those ones. Now what you have got to do is unclip the wiring loom from this. And there's quite a few plastic clips. A little pair of pliers, just pinch the end and push them through. So the bracket's now becoming loose, but it's also holding a wiring loom in the middle. So those all need popping off as well. I say quite fiddly. So I haven't shown me going underneath the car because like I said the, the bolt wasn't there but there is a bolt at the bottom that will need to be removed. Okay so it's now free to come out. The cable is still attached for the bonnet release so we will take that off as well. Now looking at this centre center part of the bar, you can see the little holes where the wiring loom attaches. And at the bottom there's some welding and that's the hole where the other bolt would have been. You probably don't need to remove the bonnet lock, but since the cable is attached and it's quite a big piece of metal hanging around, I will take the lock off so I can put the piece of metal outside. That's three 10 millimeter bolts to remove the lock. And then I'm going to put the three bolts back in so that I don't lose them. Just gonna have a quick look at that dodgy welding at the bottom. Obviously didn't hold it on the car. Okay, so I'm going to put the bolts all back in again now. Like I said, I prefer the bolts to be back where they came from. By putting them back in, at least it avoids any confusion as to which bolt came out of which hole. We now need to remove all the wiring from the manifold. So we start here with unclipping the wiring harness and disconnecting the injector connectors. We also have a couple of earth connections to remove from the engine block and again that's 10 millimeters. And there we are, a couple of wires there. And just pop that screw back in again. We can then move that part of the wiring loom away from the inlet manifold. Being careful with it though, don't want to break any of the cables. I'll speed this part up but basically there's still a few more connections that are on the throttle body. So we need to disconnect those. I think there's one bolt as well holding something onto the throttle body. So just remove all those connections so that when we remove the manifold, none of the cables from the engine bay will still be attached. So we've got a 10mm bolt here that needs to be removed. 
which is holding part of the wiring to the throttle body. So remove that and I should put the screw back in again as well. Also check under the manifold for any wires that may be clipped on and if so take them off. That one was a bit awkward but there he is just clips off underneath. Okay I'm checking around just to make sure nothing else is connected to the manifold before we can start having a go at those nuts especially that rusty one there. This might be interesting. Seems like it's taken ages to get to this point but now we just need to remove the three bolts and two nuts using a 12mm socket. The centre bolt was seriously corroded and was giving me some concern as this could make a simple job turn into a long one. So here's the five fixings that we need to undo. So these are removed with a 12mm socket and are extremely tight, certainly were on my engine. So that's one out, and that one's a bolt. And this one wasn't too bad, so that's number two, and that also was a bolt. So this one was a nut, although it, it pulled the whole stud out with it. As you can see that's like a stud. It's got like no thread in the middle. So I was using a 12.12 millimeter socket but that was starting to slip on the head so I knew I was going to lose that. So I sprayed it with some penetrating fluid and then used a six point socket which I hammered on. I was then able to use a breaker bar on it and then that one came off thankfully. And this one was another stud with no thread in the middle. So we just had the last one left which we knew was going to be a problem. Didn't seem to be any head there at all. So I chipped off as much of the rust as possible and just tried to clean it all up and blow away the debris while I was going along just so I could see what I actually had left. So I did try a normal 12mm 6 point socket um, but that wasn't going to get it off. In the end I used a 12 point and 11mm socket which I hammered on in place. So that was tight and I did try and undo that by hand as you can see but it wasn't going to move. So I thought we've probably only got one shot at this so best to use the air impact, the small one, and see if that would give it enough shock just to get that thing undone. So this is my baby impact wrench. So should give it just some nice light taps and see what that does. And there we go, out she comes. So the manifold is now off. So we can now concentrate on removing it all. I'll speed this section up, but basically I removed the pipe from the air box to the throttle body, and that was a 10 millimeter socket on the Jubilee clip. And I think there was a few more connections that was around the throttle body. So there was still one small pipe that I hadn't noticed and this was going to the throttle body I believe. So I just needed to remove that. Again I used a pair of plumber's pliers because you can just grip the, the end of the pipe and just give it a turn just to break that bond that it gets over the years. So a little twist on there. And that's normally enough just to relieve so it can come off. 
but that just pulls off now and there's also one more electrical connector which is the main one to the throttle body so that's quite a big connector at the bottom there I'm just looking at that now so you need to disconnect that one carefully Okay, so the wiring loom is now free just to be folded out of the way. Looking at the big throttle body connector there. That's a push down to pull that one out. So we can just push that out of the way. We're nearly there, but there is one more pipe that I didn't notice that was tucked away at the back of the manifold. And it's quite tricky to get to. I say tricky once again, because um, there's like a little clip on it, and the clip kept turning as I tried to get my grips onto it. So. I'll show you a picture of it. So here's a blow up of the little pipe, just tucked away there at the back. Like I say, not a lot of access to that. I kept trying to get that little clip off. And he kept turning around. So eventually I did manage to get the clip moved. So then I just used my plumber's pliers and just squeezed that rubber pipe and twisted a bit. And then he's off. So this is what it was. It was that pipe there with the water coming out of it. Just went on to there, just above the starter motor. So here's a little look at the inlet manifold. Turn it around so you can see the other parts that are connected to it. Seems a lot of work just to remove that one item. Here are some detailed photographs with labels to help with identifying all the visible parts. I will put them on for only four seconds each with the idea that you can pause them for detailed viewing. Thank you for watching and please see part two in this series.